Yeah. Well, welcome to Sports Econ 101, the show where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, Vern Glenn, F.P. Santangelo Jr., and Russell Jackman. At each commercial break, we're going to ask a sports trivia question, and I know Super Bowl just ended, so we're going to have just one more week of Super Bowl questions, and then we'll move on to other sports. Because uh, I came up with one that I thought was pretty good last time. So I go, yeah, hey, well, let's do it one more time. All right. Uh, so let's see. In the next uh, segments, uh, a couple of things I wanted to cover. Uh, Brian Flores uh, to the Steelers. I thought that's kind of interesting amid the lawsuit. Um, wanted to find out your guys' take on the All-Star Weekend and the slam dunk and, uh, you know, first team to 163. See if you guys like that. Uh, Phil Mil Mickelson faces a threat of... Uh, a PGA Tour ban uh, for heading for helping set up a, a new league, and then uh, old Jawan Howard. Holy smokes! Throwing those, throwing those punches. <laughs> but I wanted to find out uh, why Greg Gard, who is the Wisconsin head coach, why he got fined, and he didn't throw any punches. And I'm wondering if he got fined just because he called a timeout. You know, and that was unprofessional. Well, he touched Howard first, and they're saying that he instigated. Ah, okay. So, you know, I, I guess what he grabbed his uh, shirt or something, right? Probably kind of to stop him to say, hey, I want to, you know, so, sorry about calling that time out. But, boy, Jawan Howard's reach was so long that he kind of reached over two or three people to get to the assistant. Mm -hmm. the, the assistant coach must, must have said something, too. All right. Uh, let's see here. This segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, still providing mortgage investments currently yielding over 6%, secured by real estate. Doesn't get any more conservative than that. Check them out at PacificPrivateMoney.com. Stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. Don't touch that dial. We're going to be right back. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown here along with F.P. Santangelo Jr., Vernon Glenn, and Russell Jackman. Okay, guys, uh, let's start off with uh, Brian Flores. So the Steelers decide, you know what? Eh, we'll go ahead. We'll hire him amid the lawsuit. We don't care, right? Well, it is the Rooney rule. Who owns the Pittsburgh Steelers? The Rooney family. Yeah. So that is a team and that is an organization they don't care what you think with respect to race relations. I mean, they they consider themselves the landmark team. After all, the Rooney Rule stating that if there is a coaching opening, a, a minority must be interviewed for that vacant spot. And in the world of corporate business, there have been workarounds around that to technically solve that issue and then go around and hire whoever it is you wanted to hire in the first place and usually it's been someone not of color the head coach mike tomlin though you know mike mike tomlin the head coach right my point being is the head coach of the pittsburgh steelers is african-american the yeah. rooney family that owns the team set the rooney rule and so if, if if they want to go out and hire an assistant coach defensive assistant in brian flores they're going to do it Without penalty or, or without regard of, of, of what it might look like among the rest of the owners, they don't care. You know what? I think this is really, really awesome. I think this is great news for the NFL. I think it's great news for Brian Flores just because he got hired again. You know, he has a job in the NFL. When the Kaepernick thing happened, he was pretty much instantly blackballed and it was over with. So this yep. is good news and good for the Rooney family. Now, I'll be interested to see if – like, this is putting my conspiracy theory cap on. If the NFL is going to mess with the Pittsburgh Steelers because there's a guy actively suing the NFL and the owners for blackballing him, and he's in the league now, you know, some things might get interesting. And you know how petty these owners are? They're extremely petty. And I wouldn't be surprised, too, if the Steelers family that, that runs their organization gets blackballed by the owners just a little bit as well. Just because this is this is one of the most unprecedented things where a guy is suing an entire league and he's still in the league. Like, is there another instance of that happening? I could be too young. So maybe there was back in the day. Well, how are you gonna blackball the Pittsburgh Steelers? They got they got a, a, a 30 second share of all the TV revenue. I, I I don't know, I don't know what steps you would you you would make to make it tougher for the Pittsburgh Steelers yeah. with well, respect to the rest of the this and league. the optics would look terrible. Well, absolutely. The would look terrible if, 
Absolutely. Going on the owners that they're it, it could go more than just publicly, you know what I mean? Like like let's let's like think about like all the backroom meetings. Let's think about like all the meetings these owners are included in. Like it, it could go beyond football. You know what I mean? Like that's well, just well, pretty much like conspiracy theory. Happens. I mean, I, I really feel for Brian when you know he if he went for interviews and it seemed like he goes, you know what, these guys were never going to hire me. They just kind of, you know, went through the motions kind of like what, like, uh, what Byrne was saying. But I wonder now, what does that do to his lawsuit from the standpoint that how, how can he say he's discriminated against when he does get hired? You know what I mean? Does, does for that a head simply... coaching job. Say again? For a head coaching for job. For a head coaching job. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, the, 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 what, what, what blew up in everybody's face was, the text he got from Bill Belichick congratulating him on a job that he hadn't even interviewed for when it was going to, when, when, when that text was made for another Brian. Yeah. So that makes it look like, well, the Giants decision has already been made no matter what Brian Flores does in this, in this token interview. So that there's, you know, that that's, that's where the stink really rises. That's kind of weird though, because hasn't anybody ever, I'm not saying that, it didn't happen because Brian seems like a really good guy. I'm just thinking, I mean, how many times has somebody texted somebody with that seems like a first, you know, the same name? I mean, you know, Belichick is not a 22 year old kid, right? You know, he's an older guy, and older people. But the think text, but the, the but but the nature of the text was congratulating him on getting the Giants head coaching job. Mm -hmm. I, I understand, but he sent it to another Brian, like thinking maybe he thought it, he was sending it to the correct Brian. You know what I mean? I, oh, I, well, come I, on. Come, 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 come on. Just, come, on. Just... come on. Come Listen, on. He, how many, he didn't how many think times he was sending it to Brian Flores. How many times has autocorrect, you know, changed, changed what I'm trying to text to somebody? And I'm thinking, I mean, because I'm accident, or, or sometimes, you know, if you ever you ever hit reply all on, a, on an email, I did that. I did that once where I made a, I mean, it. was kind of funny because it was, it was a kind of a big business deal we were working on, and the opposition was just like, I mean, this guy was a real Yahoo, right? And I'm always kind of careful in what I put in writing. And I accidentally had hit reply. And I said, man, this guy is such a Yahoo. And then one of one of the guys on my team, so to speak, had, had emailed me and said, you know, you may not want to hit reply at all. And I was thinking, holy, no, no, did I include every, him in it? And I did. And I go, what did I write? And I go, okay, that's not so bad. <laughs> So the question I want to ask you guys, is this Brian Flores hiring a net positive, you think? Or would it have been better if he wasn't hired and he was still fighting the NFL? I think it's positive, hmm. personally. I think it's positive. But I wonder what you guys have to think. Yeah. I mean, and eventually he'll, you know, I don't know how. Well, Mike Tomlin's still pretty young. Um, and he seems to be doing a decent job. So I'm just, I don't and know. He's he's and, and he's been coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers for 10 years. Yeah. Never had a losing season. Unbelievable. Yeah. And he's got a Super Bowl title. Yeah. He's so already like, one of the all time greats. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Mike Tomlin, Super when Bowl. I think about great coaches, I think of Mike, about Mike Tomlin. So the yeah. fact that Brian Flores is going to be under Mike Tomlin, he can get his feet underneath them. Hell, you know, players start advocating for him, people in that system start advocating for him. Next thing you know, Brian Flores might have another head coaching job. Yeah. And if he doesn't, then we definitely know the NFL is blackballing him. Absolutely. So I think this is a great play, not only by Brian Flores, but, you know, just yeah. for the league. I mean, it, it's hopefully there's something positive that comes yeah, out. Yeah, I don't think it's a, like, I don't think it's going to be a distraction at all, like for the players. I mean, no, there's, absolutely there's, not. Well, the bigger deal is going to be who that, how they move on from Ben Roethlisberger, if that's how they're, you know, if it, what, you know, he's been a fixture there uh, about as long as Tomlin's been there. And uh, how are you going to uh, move on from a two-time uh, uh, winning quarterback, a Super Bowl winning yeah, quarterback? Next that's, line? Gonna, that's a really good question. A lot of people think Garoppolo is. You know, that's going to – and so, you know, do you make a big deal out of Gar Garoppolo? Do you try to draft somebody young? And, and I think that that's going to overtake most Pittsburgh Steeler fans' consciousness more than Brian Flores being, oh, yeah. being Absolutely. hired. Absolutely. Good point. All right. Uh, let's see here. we got about 45 seconds before our, uh, uh, our, our first trivia, contest, uh, trivia question. Um, so Phil Nicholson uh, faces a threat of the PGA Tour ban over helping set up 
a Saudi super golf league. Um, so setting up a, a, a competing tour, it kind of reminds me of the USFL competing with the NFL. Well, I mean, this is a topic that's going to go far beyond us having a break for your first commercial break. But I, I, I do have some thoughts about this. I, I feel bad for Phil Mickelson because he is a name. He has a brand. And right now he's alone on an island, so to speak, because yeah. he absolutely thought that his weight would be a factor in having a legion of PGA players follow him, him to this Saudi Arabian yeah. tour, which has 10 times the money of the PGA. And at the 11th hour, he he moved forward, but the, 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 the name PGA guys did not. Yeah, maybe maybe Dustin Johnson would go with him, but who knows? But I think but, but I think there's been a big reversal of, de, of, of decision. And so Here's Phil Mickelson, oh my God, just just with egg on his face because yeah. how would it look if he comes back to the PGA Tour? But then again, he's kind of committed because Greg Norman, who who's, is the face of this Saudi Arabian Tour, has kind of recruited him over. Phil Mickelson's 51. He's yeah. not a spring chicken. Not he doesn't anymore. hit at 300 yards anymore. Yeah. So he, he's, he's, it's, 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 it's a tough spot for him. Okay, guys, we're going to cut to our first commercial trivia question here. Name the three, talking about the Super Bowl, name the three teams to win the Super Bowl in multiple cities. All right, stay with us. Sports Econ 101, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown, F.P. Santangelo Jr., Russell Jackman, and Burn Glenn here. Uh, name, hey, guys, name the three teams to win the Super Bowl in multiple cities. We know it's the Rams. That's, the Rams. That, that's, that's yeah, 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 that, yeah, the Rams will take care of that. Raiders. The Raiders. Raiders. Yeah. And yeah. Baltimore are the Colts. Very good. Yeah. All right. Good Very job. good, Russ. Good job. All right. So uh, at, uh, at the break, FP was uh, uh, mentioning about how uh, the Phil Mickelson thing, it was a lot of it had to do with uh, the comments that we made by Phil. Go ahead, uh, FP. Oh, yeah. So in an interview, Phil Mickelson said about the Saudis and just the Saudi tour in general that they're scary mother effers to get involved with. We know that they killed a uh, journalist uh, and have horrid record on human rights. They execute people there for being gay. Knowing all this, why would I even consider it? Because this is once in a lifetime opportunity to reshape how the PGA tour operates. So uh, those were some very controversial That's not comments. the case. That's not what he wants it's because they throw barrels of money at him, just like they do, you know, the WWE to bring the WWE over there. It's all a matter of getting hand over fist money because of the oil money. You don't see Phil Nicholson wanting to do a, a, a tour like this in, in, you know, Africa or South America or another place that could use development, you know, much more than you can in Saudi Arabia. I mean, Saudi Arabia is a piece of crap country that just happens to have a lot of oil. And I'm sorry if I've lost a whole bunch of listeners out there in Saudi Ooh. Arabia for you, Edward. <laughs> well, but, I, I, I think there's probably some golf courses in Saudi Arabia and not so much in the Sudan. I mean, everything's a sand trap there. Yeah. But that's where you need development. That's, you know, you don't need to develop anything in Saudi Arabia because they've got, it, the only reason you're doing it is because they're throwing money at you. That's disgusting. And I, I, I'm not a fan of that. And I, I don't think that anyone should be bending over backwards to help out Saudi Arabia. After all, they haven't even they need been the money. punished for their role in 9-11. Yeah, yeah exactly. they haven't even been punished for what they did to us in 9-11. So, you know, I'm, I'm all for just, you know, boycotting Saudi Arabia as much as possible. I can't wait till we all have electric cars and solar power and Saudi Arabia and Dubai and all these other oil countries are going to mean nothing to us. It couldn't well, happen sooner. Hmm. I guess you don't need oil to produce electricity, huh? <laughs> no, I hope that's, we do that's the soon. Yeah, I remember years ago, I don't remember like how much oil was per barrel, but there was a statistic that said every time, you know, the oil rig, every time it goes up and down, Saudi Arabia was making... An angel gets its wings. Dollars. An well, angel I'm gets its wings. This to the degree of rust because I enjoy working for CBS and uh, I'm not going to uh, have any kind of comments 
that's going to have blowback on me. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> what I will say is Phil Mickelson has about four, maybe 500 million in his pension. Because when you join the PGA Tour, if you make a cut, money kicks into your pension. Now, Mickelson's been playing on the PGA Tour since his early 20s. He's 51 now. So he doesn't have to worry about the money. When you, when you win a tournament, a, 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 a good portion of that goes to your pension. So over years, this has built up in his portfolio, what have you. So uh, Phil doesn't need the money. And, um, and again, it, 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 it appears that he is in a position where he is alone on an island, so to speak. Does he actually, and, and is that number accurate? 400 million, 500 million? I mean, Est it, estimate four, 500 million in his wow. pension. Now yeah. you're talking real money. Yes. Yeah. Gener generation wealth. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Wow. He could do a lot better things with that money than trying to ahem, develop Saudi Arabia. <laughs> well, it, it, I think it's just like the expansion of the NBA, you know, get, going to China and then before that, Europe, you know. It kept, Those are even, really even developing, developing countries. That is a place. Yeah, I was going to say, even baseball, they had the barnstorming tours, you know, with Babe Ruth and all that going over uh, overseas. Bring it back. Bring it back. I thought that was great how they just show up to small neighborhoods and just... And just play pickup. Yeah. Just play pick up. Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig just would show up. It'd just be like, oh, my goodness, this is the greatest thing ever. Could you imagine if Mike Trout just showed up somewhere in, like, I don't know, South Dakota in a small town and just started yeah. playing baseball with other big leaguers? It'd be amazing. They should yeah. do that for all sports leagues. I mean, could you imagine Steph the Curry? lockout keeps going, that might be what happens. If you keep the lockout going this long, that might be the only way that we're <laughs> going to see baseball this year. That's true. Did you know that the players actually can play overseas, though, legally during a lockout? So that would be really cool if everybody just hopped over to different leagues and all over the world and spread baseball. Why not? Well, it was kind of fun when they, they played at the Field of Dreams. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Field. That was pretty cool. Yeah, really cool. Uh, so uh, going, moving on here to the uh, this uh, the NBA All Star. Uh, first of all, should they change the uh, slam dunk contest? Well, I had a question for FP because he's the youngest one out of all of us. FP, what's up, bro? Do you remember a time ever in your lifetime that the NBA slam dunk contest didn't suck? Yeah, no, twenty sixteen. Aaron Gordon versus Zach Levine. That was the greatest dunk contest probably of all time. And it went super viral. People still talk about it. It's probably the most incredible thing I've seen athletically in a showcase on that level. It was absolutely amazing. So I would point to 2016. But because of how that particular contest was judged, nobody wanted to do it anymore because it was kind of rigged in the way that Zach Levine would win. Even Dwayne Wade, who was one of the judges, said, yeah, we were going to just all give the same store, score so they'd have to go again, but I decided that Zach Levine should win. So it's uh -huh. things like that where it's like, okay, well, if you're not going to judge it correctly, why even do it? And then plus think about it from a marketing standpoint. This is Sports Econ 101. If I'm LeBron James, what do I have to gain for doing a dunk contest? If I'm, if I'm John Morant, what do I have to gain from a dunk contest? You think it's going to get me this X amount of dollars? It's going to improve my brand? Sure, maybe for like a day it'll get me more clicks, but I do that stuff in a game already every single day. Why do I need to do that? I already get those clicks online. This would just be risking hurting my ego and then not winning and embarrassing myself, worsening my brand. So it's, it's set up to fail right now. And what you have right now is basically a, a home run derby with no home run hitters in it. It's not the best dunkers. Well, I would have loved to see Kaminga. That, that oh, absolutely. He's, he's, he would have been – see, that's one that comes to mind that he would actually benefit from it because he's not well known yet. And that's the only way you're going to get this dunk contest to get to the level of 2016 because Aaron Gordon and Zach Levine, they weren't as established yet, right? True. And they kind of needed that money and that brand exposure. You need young guys that can dunk, and I'm talking about dunk dunk. Yeah. And they need to take this seriously to really help explode their brand because who knows? You know, you get on the next commercial, you get the next brand deal – that's what it's all about in the NBA. That's how you get most of your money. So, Another thing that hurts this dunk contest, and this is something that Kenny Smith was talking about during the telecast, these judges and we as fans, viewers, 
we need to see innovative dunks that no one has seen before. Mm -hmm. And when and when they do stuff that we've seen before, we're like, eh. But I don't know how creative you, how, how any more creative you can get yeah. than, than than what we've been seeing. And we we've we've seen human oh, beings yes. use props. We've seen you know gadgets. We've seen we've seen all this kind of stuff. We've so we so so as far as the originality of it, I think that. I think okay, that hurts. Do like dun, dun number, number, here, here's, been, here's been my idea actually for a number of years, and um, uh, you know I want to run it by you guys. I think I've brought it up once before, which is that um, the NBA has a device that allows you to um, measure how fast a ball goes through the rim, and that can show the power of some of these guys' dunks. So I would like to see a three-prong contest where you have the first prong be how powerful a dunk you can do. The second one would be the distance, how far you can jump and make a shot, you know, and dunk. And yeah. then the third one could be one stylistic dunk. And I mean one stylistic dunk, not 37 attempts at a stylistic dunk. And then they take the one that you finally make. You get one chance, and if you don't make it, you know, goodbye, thank you for coming. We'll, well they see should, you next year, or maybe not. For for the fans out here in uh, in Oakland, when it used to be the uh, uh, Golden State Warriors in Oakland, if, if remember uh, Thunder, uh, very very athletic uh, gentleman mascot. Uh, I remember what he would do is he'd run and then he'd jump on one of those little trampolines with the ball. Yes, and he'd he'd do a flip and then dunk it. I want to see one of the guys do that. That would be pretty cool. So, guys, I have a point to make, too, that I think is being missed. In this generation, there are people that dedicate their entire lives to stylistic dunks. Like, you know how Steph Curry works on his game? He works on his interior. He works on driving. He works on shooting the ball. He works on defense. Yeah. There are guys on TikTok and on Instagram that just do stylistic dunks all day long all over the country and get millions of views that do it better than NBA players. Cause that's well, all if you include, work. if you include those guys, then you have to augment the title and it, it, it's, it's no longer the NBA True. slam dunk contest. It's just simply a universal slam dunk contest. Cool. Maybe, maybe, maybe the door opens for that. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that would be really cool. And that's a great yeah. avenue to take, but I'm just saying like yeah. creativity, there, there's stuff out there. It's just guys do it every single day at the gym. And that's like their hobby is to come up with creative dunks while those yeah. other guys in the NBA are working on their actual game. Right. Yeah. To True. Well, that's good. I, I like that. Uh, yeah. Also, when we come back, I do want to ask you guys about uh, how, if you like the way the uh, scoring, uh, you know, who wins the game. All right. Uh, second trivia question on the Super Bowl. Which two starting quarterbacks won Super Bowls with two different teams? All right. That's our trivia question. Stay with us. Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. One more time, Edward Brown, Bern Glenn, F.P. Santangelo Jr., and Russell Jackman. Uh, trivia question number two, which two quarting, starting quarterbacks won Super Bowls with two different teams? Peyton Manning and Tom Brady. Well, there I'll go, go first. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that was funny. Uh, I was thinking, I like remember Tom Brady, but how many people will remember the, the Peyton Manning for both the Broncos and, and the Colts. Uh, go, so going back uh, to the uh, NBA All-Star weekend here. So what do you think? Uh, do you guys like the, the, the idea of the first team to 163 wins? Makes it more competitive toward the end of the game? Well, Why they did that because because there are charities involved. Each 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 person represents a particular charity. And so uh, they, 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 they did that to kind of, you know, up the ante a little bit. And... Um, but uh, but you can't <laughs> you can't deny that this past weekend that that game for for Steph Curry with 16 made threes and on the verge of setting an NBA scoring record for that game that was you know that 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 held your attention all the way through the end. I thought it was great. Plus, plus yeah. halftime when they honored the top 75 players. I thought overall the All Star game was great. It was probably one of the better ones. In the NBA, I can remember just because Steph Curry, like even if you're open, those shots are really hard to make that Curry's making. And that's what was so incredible about it. Usually, you know, they didn't play defense on Curry. Nobody really plays defense. I think Draymond Green was joking like to Curry, like, why are you actually even trying to block shots out there? <laughs> just because these guys are just out there having fun and having a good time. And that's, I think that's still great for the game and brand building to show that these guys can mess around, experiment, do something. So overall, I thought it was great, but 
I want to read you guys a tweet about the best all-star game. And I want to get you guys a thought on this. So although this weekend was fantastic, I saw this tweet from Josh Donaldson, the third baseman for the Minnesota Twins. And he said, baseball is the only legitimate all-star game in sports. You can't go easy when a guy throws 100 miles per hour. All the other sports besides hockey should stop having them. It's actually embarrassing to watch. I just Good point. Good take. I just with him at the end. I still want to watch some some of I thought the NBA one was amazing, but I think he's correct when it's baseball is the only one you can actually gear up to 100% because you can't fake swinging at a 100 mile per hour fastball. That's a good point. No, but they don't throw 100 mile per hour fastballs in uh, the in the All-Star game. Really? Yeah, they do. He's playing sure they do. Person. Yeah, they do. You can, yeah. Absolutely. You they're see, not all EFAS pitches or not anything. the entire time. Yeah, they do. Absolutely. They have a new pitcher every single inning. You got yeah. Max Scherzer throwing 100. You got Verlander coming out throwing 100. You have Jacob DeGrom throwing 102. Yeah. They, they all throw 100. You can go back to Rawls' Chapman. He was he was in the 100s too. Yeah, everybody comes out throwing their hardest. They actually don't even throw off speed because they want to do like country hardball. They want to like overpower some guys. So they absolutely do. And you can't. And especially they're only going to pitch a short time. So they, they can give it all they got in that short period of time. Yeah, they only go. Not a wise eight. thing. Who wants to get hurt in an exhibition contest? It's not a smart idea. It's it's you know. Uh, I think yelled on national it, TV. It, Who wants to give up home runs on national TV? Nobody. For a game that doesn't matter, it doesn't seem like the National League cares. Listen, I, I still remember. That they play that I, up, <laughs> I don't think you want to be the guy that gives up the most home runs in All Star Game history when. The All-Star game. Atley Hamaker somehow survived. <laughs> yeah. Hamaker yeah, but look at the, look at everyone remember. I mean, that was what 1986, I think, or something. You know, he gives up a grand slam. <laughs> People still remember it. Still remember it, yeah. Yeah. So I think Josh Donaldson, I liked half of his tweet there. I think that the NBA All-Star game is on the right track. I really think it is, but you need guys like Steph Curry to show up and yeah. start doing just phenomenal things. I, even like John Morant's dunks he was trying to do. With nobody around, I was like, oh, my goodness, this is crazy. Yeah. Like he's just trying to do in-the-air windmill, spin around dunks, and you're like, oh, my goodness. The dunk Why wasn't Steph in the, in the three-point shooting contest? Why wasn't Steph in the three-point shooting contest? He's already won it. There's no incentive. Yeah, he's won it, like, I think twice already, right? Or yeah, there's, the, yeah, there's yeah, no, has, no incentive for him to enter. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely cool. need to continue to be champion. That was pretty cool. I would have liked to see him against Carl Anthony Towns. I thought that would have been an interesting, yeah, an interesting the final. Big man, that was pretty. That was pretty impressive, wasn't it? See, yeah. I, overall, the the NBA All Star did a great job this weekend. I thought it was all the way around a good product, except for the dunk contest. That's yeah. what we'll come back to, right? We all come back to like, oh, that was awkward. Just because no, it's, it's so interesting, it, you know, you go back 25, 30 years, or whatever. You just you never saw a big guy take a three-pointer. And I remember when one time when Manute Bowl finally made one, it was just like the, the house came down because of it. But well, other than that, I mean, now, I mean, you get, you know, Carl Anthony Towns and Jokic and then... Uh, well, you know, you did have Larry Bird. It was not a small man taking threes. And Bill Lambeer was a guy who would take three-point shots. You know, they, so you did have him. Blair Rasmussen. You had some other guys. Troy Murphy. Hey guys, we're in an era now where you have big guys. You have bigs that are athletic and have range yeah. and can shoot. Giannis, you know. Dirk, Dirk Nowitzki all the way down. So just so imagine Anthony Towns years. is an athletic guy, and he showed it. Just imagine in 10 years, there's going to be guys seven foot two just drilling threes. Because yeah. yeah. It would be awesome. Uh, so at uh, Jawan Howard, uh, so he got yeah. suspended um, and fined 40000 And before we, we – uh, Vern had, had noted that uh, Greg Gard, apparently, uh, when he, they were going to shake hands, uh, I guess Jawan didn't want to shake hands, and he kind of put his hand, uh, uh, Greg Park Gard put his hand on Jawan, Jawan Howard. And I guess that's so what I have it right here that Wisconsin coach Greg Gard was fined 10000 for violating the Conference of Sportsmanship policy. That's what he was fined for. So he was fined for, for that. The sportsmanship of, of what? Calling a timeout? No. No, I think it was just no. more of just maybe talking to him, uh, like not in a proper setting. I think it was more so to appease Michigan, right? You got a huge powerhouse in Michigan, right? You don't yeah. want to upset one of your babies in the conference. Let's just throw a little excuse me fine over. I don't think he did anything wrong. 
Uh, and I, I should add that two Michigan players were suspended one game. Yeah. One Badger player was suspended one game. Mm -hmm. But here, here's the thing. In, in the flow of the game, the, the, the game was already pretty much over. Wisconsin was going to win this game double digits. Guard says, look, I have inexperienced guys out there on the floor because I'm emptying the bench. I want to make sure that they're in the right position, that they know what to do, and that's why I called a timeout. Exactly. That's what he says. Yeah. yeah. And in the, in the code of unwritten rules, Jawan Howard – comes from the school of women where you're, you're blowing us out you've embarrassed us and you're calling a timeout to prolong the game that's what set him off and yeah. so i believe that Jawan howard at the end of the game when you go through the line and you shake hands howard intended to ignore guard and walk right by him gotcha. guard then stepped in front put his hands on him briefly so we can say no no, no let me explain why i called this timeout well Jawan wasn't having it and then words were exchanged that we can't repeat on this show <laughs> And I don't know what I don't know what the assistant coach said, but, but but whatever the Badger assistant coach said, Howard tried to land a punch. It ended up being an open hand slap. But as a leader of men, no coach should do that. And I think we should all be in agreement with that. And I think and, you're and, 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 it, and, it, and it came out hours later because Jawan Howard all of a sudden maybe it was fueled by the athletic department, the president, whatever, but, the, you know, in Michigan, big school, he comes out with his huge apology, copping to everything, just yeah. saying, look, I was wrong and I am deeply sorry. He apologized to everybody. All the way. He checked off all the boxes in his public apology for what happened. He was suspended for the rest of the regular season. That's five games, suspended without pay. So you take that salary loss plus the $40,000 salary yeah. uh, $40,000 fine, that's $170,000 that is coming out of him to wherever. And 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 for that, yeah. there it is. The Michigan's having, it, Michigan's having a, they're, they're having a struggling year. They're like 16 and 14. So yeah. they may not even make the NCAA tournament. But uh, he will coach in the Big Ten tournament, and whatever happens after that happens. But – it, it, it's it's a matter of self control and yeah. No, you you we nailed, saw, we saw you nailed what it what happened from start to finish. It, everything uh, hundred percent accurate. Um, you know, it's funny because I always liked him, even when he, especially when he was with the Fab Five. You know, I mean, that was uh, that was that was quite a team to. Uh, here's, the, here's, here, here, here's here's my big question: What did the Fab Five win? Nothing. Nothing. That's Nothing. The came in second. Nothing. Yeah. But they taught us all about the the the, the uh, uh, never calling a timeout when you don't have one. That's a no. lesson that that no. uh, all basketball no. players now know for all time. If you don't have a timeout, don't call one. But it was amazing, though. I mean, because everyone still remembers how good they were. Again, they, yeah, they lost to North Carolina, uh, but they had they were just dominant for so long. Uh, I think the big the, I think the big thing is that they were all freshmen. And that was and that was just yeah. kind of unheard of, that these freshmen would, would would get as far as they did on that town. Yeah. But at the end, only Weber really proved to be a great NBA player. You know, uh, only Weber was really the out of that group was the only one to really make it big in the NBA. Well, Howard and played, he's, and he's a Hall of Famer. Yeah, I mean, Juwan had a number of good years. Um, they were all right, but not, you know, obviously, no, no stint in the Hall of Fame for him. No. And then, who unless this, gosh, this punch comes in, I've been drawn a blank now. Who, who else was there? Um, Josh King was one of them, and uh, Jalen Rose. Jalen Rose, one of them. I was gonna say Rose. I'm all. It's not Derek Rose. No, Jalen Rose. Yeah, Jalen Rose. Very good. All right, guys, we have uh, just a, a minute and a half before we have to cut to our last commercial uh, trivia question. What's on your minds? Um, I told you, you the Olympics would suck, and I was right. I, 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 I just want to go on record saying that was the worst Olympics I think I've ever watched. Noted. Yeah, no argument <laughs> from there. Nope. No. I, I, I'm glad that we will not see another Chinese-based Olympics probably for well, our lifetime. At, at least there yeah. wasn't any controversy during the yeah. 
<laughs> I remember more controversies than I remember any of the medal awards, you know, or who won any of the medals. I remember. So, and, the and, and now that the Olympics are over, now Russia can go ahead and invade Ukraine. Uh, yeah, that's the other thing too. Is that they were kind of waiting around so that they wouldn't lose any medals. I guess you know. No, it wasn't that. Medals. It was because he, he told his friend uh, Jay Ping. You know, when they the Jay Ping said, "Hey, listen, can you when you invade, could you at least not do it during the Olympics when we're the host, you know, country? Just just kind of wait because all the attention will kind of get on that." So Putin says, "Sure, I'll I'll wait. I'll just kind of put all the troops at the border and then we'll we'll just sort of see what happens." Uh, in fact, it'll be interesting because I, I kind of get this feeling that there's not going to be shots fired. Well, they actually shelling today and people died. So. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Okay. I, haven't, I, I was thinking that they might just kind of show force and Ukraine back up. But I guess Ukraine's um, got, uh, they're the very bad. proud people. Yeah. They're going, no, we don't want to give this up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's, our, uh, here's our last trivia question. Uh, last Super Bowl question for a long time. Which city has hosted the most Super Bowls? All right. That's our trivia question. Email edward at sportsecom101.com. The answer to this question, which city has hosted the most Super Bowls? And when we come back, we're going to have our thoughts for the day, and uh, then we'll say adieu. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Last time for today, Edward Brown here, along with F.P. Santangelo Jr., Vernon Glenn, and Russell Jackman. Guys, which city hosted the most Super Bowls? New Orleans. No. That's what I was thinking. Miami. 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 Okay. Okay. Okay, Vern, 30 seconds. What do you got for us? Well, I just want to make sure that the subjects that we address on the show aren't all male-dominated. Hmm. And with that, I wanted to do, do a shout-out to the U.S. women's national team, which won a landmark settlement with the U.S. Soccer Federation for $24 oh, yeah. million. Dollars. They originally had asked for $66 million in back pay. This is a lawsuit that was filed in 2019, but... It was resolved this week. Players will be paid upwards of twenty-two million dollars in a lump sum, kind of kind of spread over yeah. for a sport where the men just making the World Cup team, you get sixty-seven thousand dollars. The women, thirty-two thousand dollars. And if the men play a team outside of the top twenty-five of FIFA, they get nine thousand dollars for a win, five thousand dollars for a loss. The women. They get $5,000 for a win and nothing for a loss. So these issues have been going on for quite some time, and I'm glad that, that, that they have come to an agreement so that these women who play this great game, it's a matter of public record, their accomplishments are compensated. Boom. There you go. There you go. All right. Well okay, said. guys, you ready for – thank you very much for that, Vern. Okay, here's our thoughts of the day. So my kid, uh, he swallowed a roll of film the other day, and I asked the doctor what we should do, and he said, well, wait, let's see if anything develops. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that coming. You like that coming, okay. And uh, people say that nothing is impossible. <laughs> hey, I do nothing all day, every day. Okay, tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. We'll be discussing sports topics from a business perspective and asking more sports trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. We will see you next week. Shout out, U.S. National Women's Team. There you go. Good night.